And welcome to our panel on AI and education. I'm Joseph Bumgartner, and our panel today consists of Ruth Benander, Lori Rotilko, Smita Jadav, and Carolina DeSalvo. So the format of today's presentation is that each of our panelists will spend about five minutes talking about how they use AI in their day-to-day -day work. And then afterwards, we're going to have a Q&A session, which is then capstoned by a short uh, interactive activity. So what Ruth is going to help us do now is make sure that we have access to the site that we'll be referencing throughout everybody's um, spiel. So if you have a phone or an iPad that will read QR codes, here's a QR code. You can this fits. <laughs> and if you have a computer that you need to type on, the uh, Google site address is here at the bottom. If you, need to, if you don't have a QR code reading device. And if you are here with just a pencil in your hands, score! We'll show the site as well. So the site that you should be seeing is this site. Could you scroll down when I say scroll down, please? You got it. So if you get bored and um, think to yourself, oh, I feel like I'm tuning out, feel free. But as you tune out, if you see um, these, uh, the top five sites, these are the sites you need to know about. So the best education that you can have is hit these sites and start typing in prompts. Um, if you scroll down, then we talk, these are some of the things that we'll be talking about. Continue you scroll, please? Uh, as you, as you uh, there's a link right here. You may or may not get this to come up on your phone. We had uh, uneven phone um, access to this one. And, uh, but that's okay because when we get to this part, we'll show it in the screen if your phone won't open it. So you can take us back to the top. And off you go. All right. So our first panelist will be Lori. Uh, for our panelists today, we only have access to this microphone here, so we'll have to stand at the uh, podium. And then for those who are asking questions on our Q&A, uh, just please project clearly, and we'll be able to repeat the questions back to the audience for the purposes of those who are tuning in via recording. So Lori, when you are ready. I probably don't need a mic. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so, hi, friends. Can't? Oh, okay. I thought I would be loud enough. Um, so, hi, friends. Uh, happy Convocation Day. Um, so, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Lori Wartilko. Um, I am an associate professor, professor of marketing in the business and econ department. Um, and so as a marketer, I get super excited about all the different and innovative ways that I can use technology within my program um, and my classes and how I use it, um, you know, in everyday life. So um, for me, uh, what I have noticed is that a couple of years ago, um, I thought, well, this would be really fun to incorporate some um, gamification, which uses artificial intelligence, into my classroom uh, in order to escape, in order to create an escape room uh, as it relates to resources for my students that I need them to know about. Um, but then it just got exponentially bigger. Um, and so we look at all the things that we see typically, um, you know, within the AI world, right? And we, chat GPT is right up at the front, right? Um, and so chat GPT is great. Um, I don't use it. Uh, and so I don't use it for writing paper purposes uh, or for providing props. Um, I utilize chat GPT to write code for me. Um, things that I get excited about is um, one of my projects is developing a chat bot into my classroom. 
So I have a chat bot that is in my classroom. Um, there's a link to it, kind of like my start here page, right, for all the QM people um, in your online classes. Uh, mine's titled The Snarky Professor, um, just because it's fun and a little different, right? And I mean, and because the tone of voice is slightly snarky, right? It's like somebody can come in and say, what is the late work policy? And it'll pop up with a picture of me. For real? Did you even read the syllabus? You know, things like that where I can make it personal um, and I can have the ability to direct all of the content um, within my own chat bot so I don't have to look outside or I don't have to worry about drawing in um, content or compromising other people's um, information, my students' information. Um, so what I have found is chat but does chat bot or chat GPT uh, will write code for that. And I get really excited because I get to input that into Canvas um, and it's beautiful and I love it. Um, we know that we've got um, Microsoft, right? Utilizes uh, a chat fun bot functionality. Uh, within the course that you can use in order to create um, a similar chatbot experience within your courses. Um, it's a little clunky. I don't necessarily love it. I think I have a little bit more creative freedom um, writing you know, my code and changing things and making it a little bit more me. Um, but it's out there, right, with Copilot. Uh, so we use Copilot from Microsoft, um, and it's available to you. Uh, it was not available to me So um, when I first started this adventure. So I paid my $20 for ChatGPT. It got the robust version, slightly skirted IT, just a little bit, um, and did my own thing uh, without compromising my students' you know, personal identifying information um, and really drawing from everything within my own course that they may have questions um, and would ask a chat bot for. So it's been fun. Um, it's been kind of a relatively painful process. Um, sometimes when I very first started, um, and I'm grateful to have colleagues like Krista is you know, gonna be testing out my chat bot um, with her classroom so we can get some data um, and other, you know, colleagues that are very interested in kind of incorporating something like that maybe into your classroom. Um, I am always here to help um, with that. But I also want to point out, you know, some other things that I'm using um, as artificial intelligence. Um, and I know that it's not just my discipline, but it crosses disciplines um, where we can utilize, um, you can look at cell organization or organisms uh, via using artificial intelligence. Uh, I have a t-shirt that has code written all on this t-shirt. It's in the shape of a skeleton. And you can have people scan your, your t-shirt, right? And work through and learn how like the cardiovascular system works. You can learn about nerve endings. You can, you know, learn about, um, the health, right, of a body and what you're studying. And it's super exciting to see, like, how we are transforming um, and actually growing with technology in order to really help um, all disciplines and not just the marketing discipline that I get all excited about. That's it. That's my five minutes. So up next we have Smita. Come on up. I did make a PowerPoint presentation, but I guess we'll work from the Word document. Hello, everyone. My name is Smita Jadav, and I'm an assistant professor in the chemistry department. I have been using um, AI, specifically ChatGPT, for the past two years, and I did some classroom research project that I published as well. So to me, I 
look at ChatGPT as my virtual assistant. So nothing ChatGPT does is not already out there. As you know, ChatGPT is a generative AI, so it generates the material that already exists. It just makes it more creative instead as compared to the traditional AI, which only shows patterns. So I wanted to completely exploit that option of ChatGPT. And here are some prompts. So I always say it's all about the prompt. You have to talk to the AI. You talk to the ChatGPT. I started with the free version, the 3.5, which gave me tremendous results. So then I decided to pay $20 and get the upgraded version, which is very smooth. And those who are interested in using ChatGPT, I would definitely recommend that. It has more features like uploading files, making comparisons, and in split seconds, it gives you results. Some of the prompts that I have used in my class, and these are the ones that you can see. So this is that link in the Google document that Ruth mentioned earlier, all about the prompts. If you have trouble accessing that, here it is. So we'll go back to this document. So how does ChatGPT help with the administrative work? Let's say you want to write a letter of recommendation. To, and the example here I have is, let's say you want to write a one-page recommendation for a student, Sierra, who's in the top 15% of your biology class. I don't teach biology, but I just wanted to kind of say that. Now, when you type that prompt, it's going to give you a very glorious letter to begin with which not everything is essentially true over the top. So then you can prompt again and tell it. So we're communicating with the machine. Tell it to make, it, to make the letter less grandiose. And sort of go from there. You can customize it, tell it, add this feature to it, do mention her volunteer work or something else that it missed. Now, the easiest way to do that is, of course, with the paid version, is you upload the PDF resume that the student shares with you, and it will generate in less than a few seconds, like two, three seconds, it will generate the letter, and you take it from there how you want to customize it. So again, of course, you can sit and type this letter on your own without ChatGPT, but using ChatGPT just saves you tremendous time. The second one is translating. Let's say I want to translate the letter into Spanish or French. It will do that. Now, in my case, I don't speak either languages, so I just have to trust that it has done the good job translating. Data analysis. I use that a lot with my class as well. So if you want to compare data of three tests, so in a semester, if you give three tests, and then the final exam at the end, you can ask ChatGPT to do a comparison. You can tell it what data you're looking for. You're looking for, let's say, specific SLOs and how did the students do across over the semester, it will create that. You can ask it to create in a tabular form. So it will give a tabular form. You can ask these documents to be saved as Word document. You can ask them to be saved as PowerPoint presentation. In fact, the presentation which I had generated for you was created by Smart Slides. So ChatGPT has a couple of tools that I use that are embedded within the software. One is Smart Slides. So if you tell ChatGPT, hey, I am talking about, let's say, molar mass in my class. Can you create a five slide presentation? And it will create a presentation for you, which you can download. Now, of course, you have to go through the presentation to see if it meets the needs but at least it gives you a framework somewhere to begin with. After that, specifically in curriculum, you can generate worked examples. So let's say I'm talking about molar masses. I teach general chemistry. So we talk about molar masses, Avogadro's number, and I want the students to create a study guide for themselves. Or just say, I'm bored of looking at my own notes and I want to do something new, create new examples. I go to ChatGPT and I type the prompt which says, generate examples where um, student uses Avogadro's number with five grams of various ionic compounds. Now, if you were to do this on your own, sure, you can do this. It will take 20, 25, 30, 35 minutes. This way it will be done in less than a minute. 
you do need to do your, do your due diligence of just making sure it is giving the output that you are expecting. Similarly, you can create multiple choice questions. You can create different versions of your quiz. So let's say you spend time creating a particular version of the quiz and you have, like I have four students in on each uh, desk space while they're taking the quiz. So I won't have multiple versions to discourage any um, peeking over. And hence, I can tell ChatGPD to create three more versions for me. And that is done. So you download as a Word document, you print, you just make sure everything looks good, and you are done. After that, how many? 30 seconds. OK. <laughs> you can ask students to identify mistakes, which kind of gives them a warning that not everything ChatGPT tells you is absolute truth. You need to look through the information, explain difficult concepts, most commonly, I've used this, or I've told students to use this as a study guide, so I give them prompts. Let's say they want to balance equation, learn about balancing equations, stoichiometry, so I'll create some prompts for them. We do as a class exercise. So when they go home, they can do this on their own. If they make a mistake in any of their assessments, they can prompt ChatGPT to point out what the mistake is, which also becomes a, a learning activity. And at the end, you can use to adjust images. DALI is an image generator in ChatGPT. You can customize that image. You can tell, let's say I want an elephant teaching a classroom full of students, explaining chemistry. It can do that. You can tell now make the elephant change that to a dog. It can do that as well. So very quick, very helpful, and something creative so your students remain engaged in class. So overall, I have great experience with ChatGPT. And if anyone needs help with the prompts, I'm here to help. Thank you. Our next panelist is our staff representative, Carolina. Hello, everyone. I'm Carolina De Salvo. Uh, I work with the communication and events department. So how I have been using uh, ChatGPT and also Gemini from Google, uh, I would like to mention that I prefer ChatGPT for language is much better to generating or read proofing. Uh, but I like Gemini because it's more connected to all the Google um, information that Google is so powerful in having so, all that information stored. So I like to also check things with Gemini as well. Um, I'll mention Copilot more in the end about when I talk about uh, time efficiency that I think it can help all of us with our work. But uh, ever since I started here, uh, one thing that I've been doing a lot is video content. You probably saw me in the hallways, like interviewing students or creating some content. And uh, ChatGPT helps me to structure and plan for my video content. Sometimes I have an idea. I know how I want that video to uh, be, but I, I ask for help with the structure. I ask for help to create a script. So I just, as Mita and Laurie said, it's all about the prompts. It's how about you ask. So I give them my original idea. Uh, I add some bullet points, like I want the video to be funny. I want the student to convey this and this idea. Um, I want them to bring this information about the background. So I give... The original idea is, is mine. Like I, I know what I want from it. I just want it to be quick. I just want to create a script that would take me like 30 minutes to create. It's going to be created in just two minutes. And for a person who wears two very dynamic hats here in the college, social media and events, I really need like that help with my time. So creating scripts for video, that's for sure. And some ideas for video too. It is my virtual assistant, like Mita said. It's like I chat with it. It's like my partner. So when I don't have someone to brainstorm with, that's what I do. I brainstorm with ChatGPT and Gemini. With social media, it's really, really helpful. Um, it helps me to create engaging captions, uh, to finalize copies, to shorten copy for Twitter especially, because I work so hard in a specific copy for LinkedIn, let's say, because it's very specific, or Instagram, and then I have to shorten it for Twitter. And that would take a huge amount of time if you go from a copy that has 
so many words and you have to go to Twitter, which has like 260. So that's really, really helpful. Uh, it, it saves me hours, I would say, per week when I have to do that. Um, I also brainstorm for event and campaign ideas. Like we are creating a series for uh, Instagram. We're going to create a new series that will highlight staff or faculty, and I want to find a name for that. So I tell ChatGPT, uh, I'm imagining some name like this. I want to convey this idea, and I want a list of 10 titles it will give me in a second, and that helps. Of course, I have to analyze. I have to understand if it's attending um, my initial idea, but it works really well. Also, um, I'm a Brazilian, uh, and even being fluent in English, sometimes, depending on what's the task or what's the idea, uh, it comes to my mind first in Portuguese for some reason. It happens. And I want to express something in that first way that came to my mind in Portuguese. So it helps me with that. I'm like, I want to express this idea in this way that I did in Portuguese. And we'll get back to me in English. And I look, mm, still not what I want. And we work on that together until I have that idea expressed the way I desired. Um, what else? Oh, also, lately, it helped me a lot to analyze social media results, like all the analytics. So, of course, I look at the numbers that Meta gives me or um, Twitter gives me, TikTok, and I could analyze that, of course, and I will, but I share those numbers with it, and it gives me other inputs. So we kind of work together, and I have a much better report. So that's a good use as well. Um... Another thing, diversity and inclusion. I use ChatGPT to ensure that my communications are culturally and gender sensitive. So there's so many new ones related, you know, to culture, to gender, to countries. So I like to share, to chat with it and understand if that's correct, what I'm saying is correct, it's appropriate. So that's a good use and not only for me, but for all of us. Um, I also use that for improving, uh, I use for Excel, for better use Excel. So sometimes I don't remember formula. So I ask ChatGPT, it will remind me. I also use to reorder columns based on specific needs. So alphabetic or by date or something like that. It will organize for me, it will eliminate duplicates. So it's really helpful and it's gonna do it in seconds, so it's very, very helpful. And just sharing with you that Copilot has something that we can use with Teams for meetings, like it's gonna take notes of the entire meeting for us. So nobody will have to be assigned to that anymore. And also, you can enter a meeting on a video, let's say, and even ask uh, AI if you were mentioned before, before you entered the meeting. And if so, how you were mentioned, if there is a task assigned to you or something related to your department that you need to know about that meeting. So it's really, really helpful and that's how I've been using it. <laughs> All right. And our final panel, pa panelist, Ruth. I'll scroll for you. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, these were a lot of really great reasons to use AI, and it's really exciting, and it's a brave new world with such creatures in it, and I'm going to be chicken little. I am, I am very, very concerned about the AI that we can use in all these wonderful ways because you have to pay for the good stuff. There is a paywall between the good AI, well, good, the uh, highly efficient and well-developed AI, and then, you know, the kind of, the kind of, you know, the AI standing out, you know, by the dumpster, handing out food to the raccoons, that's free. So I'm really concerned for our students and the way that we use it, because our professional development money at this point, I do not think pays for a subscription to AI. You guys all paid your own money, right? So. It's an interesting choice for us as well. It follows along with the cell phones, that you need to have a cell phone, you gotta pay for your cell phone. You want good AI, you gotta pay for your good AI. So it's interesting as we fold it into our classrooms and think about 
um, how the digital divide has been affected by AI. One thing that I would like to mention is that all the AI detectors are of differing detection. So yeah, everything I do has turned it in. But I do want to mention that there is, um, well, it'll be, on the on, it'll be on our online teaching community that will write discussion board posts for you, for your students. And uh, so that's an interesting thing. And you, and you don't, uh, turn it in doesn't affect that at the moment. So it's interesting to consider how AI is in our soup. Now only 38% 30, of our students have reported that they enthusiastically embrace it. I think that number changes because this whole situation changes. It's time for us to rethink for ourselves what is plagiarism and thinking about how plagiarism in interaction with AI is different. Carolina was talking about working with the AI as an assistant. So that is something we need to help our students learn how to do appropriately because I've been on search committees and we've had a whole bunch of cover letters written by AI. They are awful. They will meet so many words. Oh, and everyone is so wonderful. So many adjectives. <laughs> Scroll down. So I'd like to, um, if you're in clinical practice, you might recommend, recognize Miller's proficiency in clinical practice. And this is an interesting way that I think about AI in my composition classes, because I will tell you, I definitely generated some stomach acid over the summer in trying to think about how am I going to fold AI into my composition classes in a responsible way that won't make me feel bad. So I like to think about this uh, performance in practice. So in fact, recall, you know all your stuff's out there in Chegg. So and on Bloom's taxonomy, remember is, you know, that is a whole different way for our students to work with that. So that's definitely AI and the student. AI can support the student in interpretation and application because you can ask it to reorder stuff and to analyze large, um, parts of data. The, you can take your notes from class, put it into Grammarly, and it will make flashcards and quizzes for you. So that's nice. But we have to help the student understand that they still have to demonstrate knowledge on their own. They still have to demonstrate skills on their own. And they have to demonstrate in practice that they are able to perform. So when I think about creating my assignments in my composition classes, this is how I think about it. Yeah, have the AI write an outline for you. Sometimes that outline is way better than the outline they would have come up with. And it results in a much more difficult paper. But I have to be able to... Um, work with, help them work with that AI so that it's not writing the paper for them and it's abs and it's, it's fast, but it's no matter how fast it is, it's still a waste of time. So I want to think, now you may assign writing in your classes, you may assign discussion boards. So I want to think about a different writing process in which the AI can support whether it's, whether it's the, um, the, the free version or the paid version. And that's, that still distresses me at, at a really profound level about how our students are going to have to pay for it. Now we have to pay for it. Um, but it's important for students to know that when they have generated, they have to, they have to reread it. And there's a lot of stuff from the medical uh, research that when the medical notes and emails are sent out, written by AI, unfortunate in, uh, information is communicated to the patients. So review and revise drives powerful learning, and we really want our students to realize that when they're using AI, they need to review and revise. So the key principles to think about is that if you're asking your students to write, writing is a behavior. So be really, I have to be really clear in my writing prompts about what I want students to do with that writing. So it makes me a much more responsible composition instructor. And I want students to be able to articulate for me the purpose of their writing. And I need them to, my, in my class, I need them to generate the AI stuff and then critique it. So they'll come up with a Word document, they have to read through the essay that AI generated for them and then put commentary into using comments and um, track changes to show their analysis of the AI, uh, what it generated for them. And then finally, reflection is really important. They can generate all this stuff, but AI can't reflect. The student has to reflect about what was going on. So reflection has taken on way more points in my classes. And so now we're ready to entertain your questions.
Yeah, so at this point, we will open it up to the room. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we'll start <laughs> eager. It's virtuality. It's that, it, and it's spelled like T E E, like virtuala, and then there's a hyphen, and it's T E E. Yeah. Okay. So is that the question was uh, Rad Tech faculty were interested in Lori's skeleton shirt yes. and virtuality. Virtuality. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, there's an app like you can scan it. Like you open up your camera, you scan it, and it's it's pretty amazing, um, and. Um, because you know AI crosses disciplines. It's not just about all marketers, right? Even though we think it should be, um, but like that's what some of the different tools that you know can be utilized cross functionally. Sure. In front. So a question about the cost of these uh, things, and I believe they're all subscriptions, right? Yeah. So yep. the 3.5 version is free, and it works just as you agree. If you just want to take it to the next level, then the paid version comes in. I use the free one, just so you know. It works, hmm. yeah. And are you guys, like, downloading it on one computer? Do you download the app, and you can use your website? You can use it in your browser. Website. So any questions about Copilot? Oh, okay. Copilot inside the UC system is safe <laughs> because it only scrapes from inside um, the UC system. So if you are highly present, for example, um, uh, Emily Lopez, is Emily here? Emily Lopez is our, is our new instructional designer. So we asked Copilot within the system, give me a biography of Ruth Benander, and it was, dead on, because as you saw earlier in convocation, I've been here forever. I'm a UCBA granny now. So, so it, was, it was great. My stuff is all over to be scraped within the university. But Emily just joined us. It did not have any idea who she was. So the issue with using Copilot uh, within our system is it's very safe, it's within our firewall, and it is thereby limited because, as you know, AI is merely scraping information to look for statistical patterns. And the smaller your scrape, the less reliable those statistical patterns are. Follow up then, does it have some of the functionality that was mentioned for the higher version of ChatGPT as far as and analyzing documents and things like that? It is, it is more limited than that. It is, it is not quite as good. Lori, did you have a perspective on that? Yeah, I don't love it um, because it, it hinders my creative ability. Um, that was, so when I took this on, um, creating this chat bot uh, several years ago, um, I was told that we were, I was not allowed to circumvent anything regarding IT. May or may not have done that. Um, <laughs> I can't. Uh, you are right. being recorded right now. Right. So <laughs> they know. It's fine. <laughs> they know. Um, so, and I was kind of pushed into this co pilot, you know, piece, but we didn't have it. UC was not on board with co pilot yet. And so it was kind of a, a pain in the butt to be able to create my own chatbot if I can't be created and I don't have access to the tools that I need within, you know, our university system. Um, so when they came out over the summer and they were like, hey, we're using Copilot, I was like, you have got to be kidding me. Like, fine, I've already created what I like and I'll continue to use that because it scrapes from the inside of my classroom. And so I still feel like I can, you know, protect student information. Um, it's safe within my classroom because it's only pulling data from my syllabus, what I put into it. Um, Copilot, I, I truly feels a little clunky. Um, it doesn't necessarily meet my needs um, that I have been utilizing it for, um, which is why I went a different route and created my own. The quality of a generative language system is the size of the database. Amber?
anybody tried that? With like a department meeting or teams. Um, I haven't used it in a meeting yet, um, but it's something I know. It's like I want to do that. I want to do it in a meeting and take notes and understand the mention. It's summarized uh, per topic, so it saves a lot of time. It doesn't go wrong. So what, when we think that it will save us time, that it takes notes in our, in our meetings, I've, I've participated in meetings who took those notes, the, it, the amount of time it took to revise and adjust was about the same amount of time as it would have taken for a human being to take some accurate minutes. It means it's still in, in a process, right? Yeah. yeah. And we see a lot of, like, um, especially with social media, right, and TikTok right now, everything, my whole feed is just flushed with students going back to school, right? And so how can you make life easier for your students, right? They get to take notes for you. AI, AI will take your notes for you. Um, and then it'll print it out into this beautifully written, you know, whatever you need to do uh, or however you want your notes highlighted. Um, and it will do it for, AI will do it for you um, as a student. And so I have started testing that kind of stuff, like, all right, well, how accurate is this? Like, are they really going to get, you know, what I'm, I'm putting out there? Are they connecting, like, my examples to, you know, what we're talking about in the book um, and all those concepts? Are they, you know, connecting what my learning outcomes are and how that looks? Um, and it's hit or miss. Like, some, some things, you know, really capture it well. Some things, I mean, it doesn't know me and my jargon, though, right? Like, it doesn't know you and what you're talking about, like, exponentially. So. I would say that, let's say you're taking notes on the paper and you feel like me struggling out, maybe through the meeting, you can take a picture, upload it to chat GPT, and it will create a transcript for you. So last couple of weeks ago I was at a conference, I took some notes and I can read my albums part of it. I took a picture and then uploaded the link to the presenter slides and it created a beautiful summary for me, including the slide. This is how creative you can get. Tracer, sorry. Okay, yeah, so here's my problem. Okay. Lori, can you explain what a chat bot is and how it is used in the classroom at the level of an eighth grader? Sure. So um, I, I created my own little Memoji that looks exactly like me, um, glasses and all, just because that's how extra I am. And um, whenever somebody clicks on my chat bot, it pops up my cute little face. Um, and it's like, hey, how can I help you today? Because that's how I am. And that's kind of, you know, that's how I talk. And so I made sure that I was able to um, create my voice and uh, write it into the code within my, my chat bot. So that way when students come in and say, hey, what's the late work policy? And it comes back like, did you read the syllabus? Like, that's, that's literally my voice, right? Because, and, yeah, you know, with my nice little thing. So how is this linked? What is this like? Is this on your Canvas site? It's on my, yeah, it's in each one of my classrooms in Canvas. Can you see it? Um, I can send something out. I did not create slides. I was in the ICU last week, so I didn't do anything for this. Like, I, I wing it because that's By the my time favorite. she was describing, I wanted to <laughs> yeah. I'm curious to see it. So I can I can send that stuff out. Yeah, that you can test it. Can it actually answer questions about the course? Are you feeding it your syllabus? Yeah, I feed it my syllabus. I upload it um, into my syllabus, and so that way everything has access to it. Um, you know, so if it's like, hey, what chapter are we working on in week four? It'll pull up my course content. Canvas does. Uh, Kelsey. Yeah, so I think last year you guys mentioned one of the safety precautions, like don't use your email, like for students to do this. Um, is that still 
So ChatGPT has great memory. Depending on what you have been feeding it, it will consume and remember that. So let's say if I talk about moles in chemistry, it's never going to get confused for the fuzzy animal. It will know what a mole definition is. So that way it remembers, and plus it has a history. So you can browse through the history. If I was working on, let's say, a couple projects last year, I can go through the history click on it, and it will take me to that point. And then when I continue working further, it will only refer to that particular uh, frame of mind or thought process that was going on. But yeah, it, it will remember. So it will always know, let's say you're a chemistry professor, and that's your context of whatever you're looking for. And just adding to that, um, the other day, I, asked for, I added a prompt. I wanted to write something to social media. And then after I sent the prompt, I was like, oh, I forgot to say Yusuf Oesh. I'm talking about, he already knew because I used constantly for that. <laughs> so he already fixed for me in Thailand. I didn't have to. Also, they have, it has a history, but it doesn't have a search. I don't know if the paid version has. But the free one, there, there's no like search uh, that you, you know, something you did two months ago is not going to find for you. Like, but you can talk to it. Do you remember when we talk about this topic? And then you go back and it's just something that you already talked with it. All right, we have time for about another question and we'll go to our review activity in the back. I'm just curious, if you use your canvas creating that chatbot, what happens if they feed a question that you're not prepared to answer the chatbot? Is it feedback to you, like an email? Uh, not so much because, um, like, I don't even have it set up like if the question isn't answered. Um, my thought is that if it's not answered, maybe they'll send me an email <laughs> and open up that line of communication. Um, so that, that for me, um, it's really minimal, I guess is the best way I know how to describe it. Um, it's just there to answer like surface level questions, not definitely to get into the weeds about questions. And if they have in the weed conversations, they can just email me, they can text me, they can whatever, see me after class, come to office hours, crazy. <laughs> All right, got time for one more question. Coach and guide. This is what they need to know. Uh, AI is being incorporated into all kinds of professional software, so that when they in the job that they go into, they will expect it to, they will be expected to know how to prompt and not traumatize the clients with inappropriate information. Recently, there was a um, a suit in um, Florida where the AI took notes from the doctor's uh, conversation turned it into a summary that was then turned into an email and sent to um, one of the patients that said that they were having nasal discharge and one of the possibilities could have been their brain leaking out their nose. So this was a serious problem. Also in those notes, um, uh, saccharin was used as a way of saying, oh, well, that's, don't worry about any saccharin comments. But it turned into a problem of the patient having diabetes. So 
there are, our students need to know how to do this. And if we coach them, then we know the AI is being used. So dive into it so you know it's happening. So yes, coach and reflect, coach and reflect, totally reflect. We've got to reflect. And I don't say that just because I'm in composition. I say that because I'm a human being and a teacher, both. And for the record, I like raccoons. Hi, Jen, before I forget, um, if you listen to podcasts, uh, there's a professor called Pop Prof G. Uh, he has his own podcast, which is actually kind of what um, prompted me to start my own chat bot. Chat bot. Um, and so I went through some of his steps uh, after listening through one of his podcasts. Um, in order to kind of work with um, a company, which didn't end up in fruition, but that's okay. Um, but um, he's got some resources out there as well um, in order to help kind of with like the AI and um, steps that he took and how he uses. And you can see on his, um, he has a website and you can see how he uses it on his website as well as listening to his podcast. So we'll be taking a lot of the information that this this website, uh, Smitha's handout, all of this will be on the online teaching community Canvas site. If you're not already there, um, talk to Brenda in the Learning and Teaching Center or Emily Lopez, and we will get you into that site immediately. What I'd like you to do, if, if you would do us a favor now so that we can do our reflect, and this is an interesting thing for us all to consider. So if you might, Go to this form. It is anonymous. It doesn't keep uh, anybody's information, but it is a way for us to think about how, in general, we are beginning to work with it. Because since it changes every every month, every week, um, it's important that we keep talking about it because uh, a lot is changing. <coughs> so if you could just. Quickly fill this out. Single words are fine. If anyone is interested in this reflective assignment, I'd be happy to email it to you. This is a great way to get students to think about how they value what is happening to them in their classes. Everybody's got it on their phones. One more phone went up, another phone was up.
So as you keep working on this, um, what's nice about these uh, short answer questions in Microsoft Forms is they'll give you a nice word cloud. So this is also what you do in your class, really quickly, really quickly to get quick feedback and you can get in time feedback. So it looks like I love that overwhelm is in the middle of our word cloud. I think it's lovely and appropriate. Because as Dean Leitner said, it's okay to be a little stressed. This is going to be hard. And that's why it's good to do those experiments. But it's lovely to see, um, I love overwhelmed and stressed, overwhelmed and irritated. I know that described me all summer. <laughs> uh, predatory and trepidatious are two really good words for this. Uh, it's important to think about the ethical problems that are going on at so many levels when you think about this. Um, could you scroll down to the second question, please? Yeah. We were, these word clouds I'll also put onto our site. Uh, information shaping your thinking. The medical incidents are really important. Uh, the digital, ins, uh, digital assistance is important. And the, I love that uh, students is right there in the middle of it. And thinking about helping our students understand the possibilities and limitations are important things to think about. Um, new ideas, could you give us the next one? In our new ideas, the reflection is, is really important to help students understand their interaction with the AI, rather than saying, this is great, it's going to do it all for me. So really encouraging reflection becomes really important. Better writing and outlines, that's really good. But again, you need to have the reflection for that to have that same uh, uh, impact. Uh, I love the growing exponential course prep. Yup. Remember how they told, I don't know if anyone here is old enough, some of you are. Remember what they said online teaching was going to be so easy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing with AI. Not going to be easy. Not going to be easy. Um, things that you will include. Yeah. AI use. You got to fold it in. It's going to happen anyway. So you, you may as well. It's, I don't know if anybody here is old enough to remember the, you know, I like granny from earlier. Does anybody remember when we started to have rubrics? And I was like, oh, no, this is terrible. And, oh, wow, now the rubric helpful. So it's uh, interesting to think about this being a new visual skill and the virtue about it. Very dark. Do you think your professional development class will cover it? Me. <laughs> oh, everybody, everybody uh, get that money from the uh, using the early, early alert. Early alert, and everyone can have the t-shirt. Yes. 100% department, 50% of your part-time faculty. Right. Oh. 50% of part-time, 100% of the Unless they change. If you want that t-shirt, do that now. The change I'm seeing as a result of AI is work. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, appearing work. Saving time, it does fit sometimes. I think it's really good for the titles of uh, journal articles or workshop presentations, but you really got to pay attention to it because then it starts to, um, that, that review and revise is really important. The student's inability, I think it's student stress, because when you're totally stressed, you believe it looks good. So that goes back to creep. Look out for AI being a headwind rather than a tailwind. New ways I'm thinking about working with AI include use. Yep. Yay. Use it. Uh, appropriate pictures. Yeah, it still has a hard time with hands and legs. Uh, so be cautious also in generating images of stereotypes, because what DALI does is it, it, it creates things and it uh, scrapes from other images, and you can get some really offensive stereotypes when you use that image generation. So just be super careful with that. Can we are going to add in something? Yeah. Twitch, um, if you uh, follow Twitch or you have gamer kids, they know about it. Um, Twitch, I use that for um, students to generate, like, really bad logos. 
um, in the class and we talk about them and um, how it used AI to uh, create logos, um, particularly for me um, in my classes because that's you know what we do. Um, so it's been interesting to see um, how Twitch has really evolved. Um, there's a whole bunch of data that's out there that I can also share with Canvas that. Canvas also has a Canva. Canva mm -hmm. that makes um, uh, infographics and posters and stuff. Really great. It does have an AI support. Incredibly racist and sexist. So keep an eye on it. I mean, you can generate these lovely posters and infographics um, but it's not it's not scraping from healthy data, so it's good to take a look at data. Data analysis and graph generation are really where the power is in this, where it, um, because it can take huge amounts of information and then little that for you, which is really nice. Um, I can help others understand the importance of AI, but can we have the last word? Product? Practicing using it and reflecting on it. Yes, please. Yes, please. Reflect. Teaching our students to reflect is perhaps the most important thing that we can do when it comes to all the incredibly creative ways that you can use AI and being aware of the cultural implications of, of what they're doing with that. Tours and reflections. Share, yeah, share this information. Share examples. Ask them to always reflect. Um, <laughs> yes, and emphasizing perfection, or rather just saying you need to continue to work with it. So I'll include these uh, word clouds on our website as well, and it will be available on our um, online teaching community web, uh, Canvas site. Let me know. And with that, that'll conclude our session today. So I would like to thank our panelists, Smita, Carolina, Lori, and Ruth. And of course, thank you for your questions and your attention over this past hour. So have a good convocation and good luck this semester.